Why did I decide to start at the beginning of this story? I'm awful at beginnings. Andrew is always talking about how we need to have good hooks so the reader will actually be interested for more than 10 seconds. Hooks are not my strong suit. To the point where the hook of my short story in English in grade eight took place in the middle of the plot and the rest of my exposition was explaining how the character got to that point. And that one video I watched said to always introduce the character or the protagonist at the beginning so the hook should have something to do with her. Okay, she lives on a farm. I know this. So maybe at the beginning she should be doing farm things like milking cows <laughs> or feeding chickens. Ooh, I like the chickens. Maybe she should be collecting chicken eggs, but the chicken should be bothersome. Yes, I like that. So she's trying to get the eggs, but the chicken isn't letting her, and she's irritated. She's mad at the chicken. So Willow was really starting to despise this chicken. Little did I know, that was more than the beginning of the story. It was also the beginning of one of the most grueling things I've ever done. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elsa Ross, and welcome to my Masterworks presentation, To Write or Not to Write exploring the process of writing a fantasy novella. For as long as I can remember, I've loved stories. In fact, this, I loved the stories my parents were reading to me at bedtime so much that I got so good at reading on my own just so that I could read the stories on my own. Now, anyone who knows me at all has probably seen me sitting somewhere in a position that looks like it shouldn't be comfortable but somehow is with a 400 to 800 page book in my hands. <laughs> But just reading the stories was never really enough for me, and from a young age, I wanted to create my own. As an only child, I spent a lot of my time before kindergarten coming up with stories in which I was the main character, then proceeded to act them out with my imaginary friends. That started happening less frequently once I started going to big kid school. But by then, I was already getting better at something else, writing. I wrote my first story when I was five years old, and I have absolutely no memory whatsoever what it was about. All I know is that it was approximately one page long, double-spaced, except it was written in a kindergartner's handwriting on a piece of paper that I have since lost, so really, I have no idea. I've been writing things ever since, and now, 10 years later, the novella I wrote from a Masterworks project is sitting at 32,642 words and 57 pages, single-spaced in size 11 font. <laughs> it was stressful, to say the least. But now that I've done it, when I decide to do it again, writing a book will be a piece of cake. <laughs> Except the cake is from Wonderland, and it makes you shrink, and suddenly you're surrounded by this thing called plot that's wondering when you'll actually get around to creating it. <laughs> Today, I will talk about plot and its relation to the genre of the story, world building, character building, my own experience with all of that, and my quest to actually write a novella. I'm sure we're all familiar with this the plot structure mountain. It's the thing that every English teacher ever shows to their class when studying the creative writing unit. In fact, this project in itself follows the plot mountain rather well. The topic selection and initial research is the exposition, the character and world building, plot creation, and main body of writing is the rising action, finishing the, paper of the, finishing the first draft of the novella is the climax, editing, finishing the paper, writing the script, and making the Google Slides is the following action, and this presentation is the resolution. Of course, plot isn't just some universal thing where every story has an equal amount of exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, or resolution. Some stories don't have much in the way of an exposition at all, and just slow you right into what's happening. Personally, I think that's a bit abrupt, despite the fact that I myself am guilty of doing this to avoid writing introductions. Other stories don't have a lot of falling action, and the resolution happens almost immediately after the climax. Another variable is the genre of the story. The genre can have a direct effect on how much of each part of the plot there is. For instance, in a mystery story, there's usually an exposition where something is stolen or someone is killed, rising action where the de detective finds clues, the climax where the detective catches the criminal, and the falling action and resolution where the crim criminal is arrested and all is once again right in the community. In fantasy, however, it's a bit different. In many of the fantasy stories, and a few sci-fi stories as well, the exposition is a dangerous event that sends a seemingly ordinary young protagonist on a quest to a certain place to meet a wise mentor figure. In the rising action, the wise mentor figure reveals that the protagonist is or will be special and is important to the fate of the world. The young protagonist then goes on a much longer journey than initially anticipated. Is this sounding familiar? <laughs> they usually have a best friend and or sidekick with them without whom the protagonist wouldn't have survived or been able to take down the main antagonist. 
Also, the wise mentor figure usually dies, and another character who was presumed dead is revealed to either not be dead, or is brought back to life, or visits the protagonist from the afterlife. Did I just describe Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, or Harry Potter? <laughs> <laughs> Something I didn't realize until I was 8,000 words in and halfway through my research is that my own plot follows a similar pattern, though without the death of the wise mentor figure and the great reveal of a previously dead character no longer being dead. Everyone who died in my story stayed very much not alive. In the exposition of my story, the seemingly young protagonist leaves her home because her brother was evil and attacked them. Along with her friend, she goes to a village during the rising action, where she meets the wise mentor figure who reveals that she's the most powerful magic user in the world, and only she can defeat the main antagonist. She and her friend then go on a road trip across the world, except on foot instead of in a car, and defeat the bad guy. This becomes the climax. The friend saves the main protagonist's life more than once. That's all well and good, but there's no use having a story if you don't have a world for it to take place in. Some fantasy stories, like Harry Potter, take place in our world, but with fantasy elements like magic, dragons, unicorns, etc., that set it apart from realistic fiction. Other fantasy stories take place in a world that's completely separate from ours, the most obvious example of this being Lord of the Rings, which takes place in Middle-earth, a world of Tolkien's own imagining. There are a lot of things to consider when creating a world, such as geography, civilizations, government and economics, religion, technology, language, and magic. However, the author is usually the only person who knows all of this, because most of it doesn't end up in the final draft of the story. In fact, arguably, you don't even have to worry about some of it, simply because it's just not in the story at all. When creating the world that my story takes place in, there's a lot of things I overlooked in favor of dealing with what was relevant to the plot. This means that my world doesn't have much in the way of a government, it has an underdeveloped magic system, a gloss over of religion, and a general lack of people. <laughs> on the one hand, that could be considered lazy. On the other hand, it leaves, me open, it leaves it open for me to possibly develop all of that further in a sequel. Depending on how you look at it and how you tend to work as a person, world building can either be the most time consuming part of writing a story, or it can be the most rushed part. You can't just finesse your way through creating your characters. You can have a brilliant, enthralling story and no one will read it because your characters aren't believable, interesting, or relatable. One of the most common pieces of writing advice is to write what you know. Speaking from experience, that's probably the most helpful piece of writing advice too. The main character in my story is a 17-year-old girl who is incredibly musical, musically inclined and has four older brothers. I am a 15-year-old girl who plays the piano and is an only child. Different? Yes, but similar. Really, the only difference between being 15 and being 17 is two more years of questioning your sanity, your friends and family's sanity, and the world's sanity. And as an only child, I spend a lot of time with people who are older than I am in the form of my parents and their friends. Sorry, I can't see my script because the microphone's in the way. <laughs> Though, as I'm sure my parents can tell you, that did not exclude me from being a petulant child. <laughs> Facing your characters off of yourself and people you know makes them more believable, and the more believable your characters, the more relatable they'll be. The more relatable your characters are, the more in invested in the story potential readers will be. Of course, you have to make sure to tailor to your intended audience. Your intended audience should be a demographic that you yourself can or could be able to relate to. My own story is aimed at teenagers, because I'm a teenager and I'm not about to go write a 50,000 word adult romance novel. <laughs> Basically, my strategy while creating my characters was to make sure that I found them relatable, because if I'm relating to my own characters, other people my age should be able to as well. Of course, none of that is worth anything if the character's role in the plot hasn't been determined and their personal challenges and goals created accordingly. Every story has one protagonist and one antagonist. But wait, if there's only one in each of one of each and every story, then how come in Harry Potter, Malfoy is an antagonist, but so is Voldemort? Simple. There can be more than one story within a plot. I mean, that's how a series works, isn't it? Besides, every story has two sides in which the titles protagonist and antagonist are reversed. One of the most common misconceptions is that protagonist and hero are synonymous, as are antagonist and villain. But that's not true. The protagonist is simply the main character of the story you wish to tell. And if you're telling the story of Team Good, then yes, the protagonist will be a hero. But if you're telling the story of Team Bad, the protagonist will be a villain. And antagonist doesn't always mean the person the protagonist has to defeat. 
An antagonist can be anyone who stands against the protagonist in some way. This can be as obvious and notable as the big bad that must be defeated, or it can be as simple and domestic as two siblings having an argument. Now, having a protagonist and an antagonist sorted out is all well and good, but there's more to a character than their role in the story. Every person has flaws, and fictional people are no exception. Though, in context, there are more emotional factors that inhibit the character's ability to achieve their goal than actual flaws. For instance, one of the most common flaws in protagonists is a lack of confidence in themselves, while the most common flaw in an antagonist include overconfidence and pride. I decided to change that up by having my main character be confident but very concerned about the implications of battle, such as hurting people, and my, having my main antagonist be prideful but easily flustered. All of this, combined with the other characters, led to a very, very long period of time during which I attempted to claw out my hair multiple times. And that's not even including names. So, what came out of all this research and mild irritation? A novella, somehow. Normally, when I write, I start with the parts I want to write most, then write the filler part that gets us from point A to point B. However, back in October, I decided I wanted to write this chronologically, starting from the very beginning and going to the end, no jumping around in the timeline. This is both a good decision and a bad one. For one, you may, as you may recall me saying earlier, beginnings are not my strong suit. Somehow, I managed to come up with an introductory sentence at a birthday party of all places, though I suppose it makes sense knowing my tendency to periodically hide during social functions, but I digress. What ensued was a long, exhausting, slightly maddening endeavor that resulted in multiple urges to throw my Chromebook across the room. Naturally, once I had an introduction, I needed to actually come up with names for everyone other than the main character. Now, I am notoriously bad at coming up with names, both for characters and stories and essays. In fact, the title of my novella actually was the result of the collective genius of me, Andrea, and Tegan. <laughs> This led to me picking themes for each group of people involved in my story. The main character and her family were tree-themed, the other important family was fire-themed, the village they all lived in was music-themed, and the bad guys were just, well, bad-themed. <laughs> With that in mind, I then proceeded to pick words related to each of those themes and put them into Google Translate until I found something I liked. The result of this was the English translation of the main character's older brother's name being Sage Leaf Tree. Eloquent, I know. <laughs> Once I'd sorted out everyone's names, I could proceed with the actual writing. For a while, everything seemed to be okay, and then it hit. The first bout of writer's block. I quickly discovered that the writer's block was tied to my lack of motivation for writing that segment of the plot, and created a writer's block document accordingly. Initially, my writer's block document only had a few short snippets of random ideas that were completely unrelated to my masterworks project, but that changed alarmingly quickly. I soon had fully written out short stories that had nothing to do with what I was supposed to be doing. That document is sitting at a word count of 45,928. <laughs> Fortunately, the writer's block didn't last forever, and I soon got back into the rhythm of things. Then I decided I wanted a romantic subplot. I am quite possibly the worst person to be writing romance, as I personally have yet to be interested in it. Not only that, but I'm spectacular, spectacularly oblivious when it comes to seeing it around me. Honestly, two of my best friends could start dating, and I'd be standing there thinking, wait, they were in love? <laughs> and yet here we are, a romantic subplot completed and hopefully believable. According to my friend, the fact that both people involved were too busy thinking the other hated them to notice that they were mutually pining for each other is, re is very realistic, so I think I did okay. <laughs> Going back to what I said earlier, it's always best to write about what you know. If that means playful banter and interactions between the protagonists, then that, that means playful banter and interactions between the protagonists. For instance, what do you mean, Sage is your brother? Leaf had gotten back on the horse, though his voice had risen an octave. What do you think I mean? He's my brother. There's only so many things I could possibly be implying, Willow said snarkily. Anyway, why did you two hate each other? Uh, it's complicated, and I'd rather not talk about it with my childhood nemesis's sister. No offense, Leaf said, regaining his composure. On an unrelated note, the village is to the north. You're going west. I was going north earlier. Well, you're not now. Turn right. No, 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 you're other right. These woods can be a little, um, confusing. Uh, you know what? Let me drive the horse. 
I know where I'm going. Willow made a face, repeating Leaf's words in a mocking tone, but she slid off the horse anyway, then climbed back on after Leaf shimmied forward and took the reins, which weren't actually reins, as they were riding bareback, and were actually just two strands of the horse's mane. You know, you could have just told me if I was going the wrong way, she snapped. You didn't have to revoke my driving rights. Leaf snorted. Right, because you didn't just hit, almost hit a tree a minute ago. Face it, kid, you're from open fields. I can tell. You smell like grass. Trees on your turf. I... How the hell do you know what I smell like? I've been sitting behind you for the last 20 minutes. I think I know what you smell like. <laughs> Willow didn't have an adequate response to that, so she resorted to the I'm an annoying little sister strategy, proceeding to poke Leaf all over his back. After about 15 minutes of this, Leaf had had enough. He elbowed her in the stomach. Hey, she muttered. Huh, you're the one who's been poking me for more than 10 minutes. I think retaliation is allowed. Ugh, is this what my sister would have been like if she hadn't been kidnapped? Yes. You suck, you know that? Yes. Willow went back to poking him. Leaf just sighed. <laughs> this was, of course, inspired by interactions I've witnessed between my friends and their younger siblings. But writing based on witnessed interactions is one thing. Writing based on personal experience is another. Something I've noticed by going back and editing is that Leaf's personality is alarmingly similar to my own. This was completely unintentional, but there is another scene involving Willow and Leaf that's based on a conversation I had with my dad in which, where I tried to explain to him how to read sheet music. It did not go well. In the scene with Willow and Leaf, they're talking about first violins, second violins, and violas, but it's the same basic scenario. The music hall was clearly the most extravagant building in the entire village. It was separated into sections based on the instruments in each section. Surprisingly, the, the, they were the only ones in the music hall, leaving them free to take in the organized piles of instruments. Leaf took Willow on a tour, pointing out each section, what was in it, and why. She was finding it difficult to wrap her head around why the first violins and second violins were in the same section, but separated by the violas. As far as she was concerned, they could be generalized as violins and slightly larger violins. Leaf did not seem bothered by this, however, and when she asked why they were organized like this, he said, well, it's obvious. The first violins play different melodies than the second violins. Needless to say, Willow was unimpressed with this answer. I don't think I even realized at the time I was writing it that it was based on that conversation I had with my dad, though thinking on it now, it's very obvious to me. Of course, I've always been a very fact-driven person when it comes to the real world, and since the quarantine started, lately that's been applying to movies as well. The number of Arnold Schwarzenegger films we've watched in the last three months that have no concept of physics at all is astounding. <laughs> but that's irrelevant. What is relevant, however, is the fact that my appreciation of logic and common sense was not lost in my writing, and I think that's well reflected in the scene where Willow has been captured by the main antagonist. Willow woke in a cold sweat. She was sitting in a chair in a cold, plain room. The walls were dull stone, with flickering torches mounted every three feet or so, filling the room with the stifling atmosphere of smoke and oil. Her wrists were tied to the arms of the chair and her ankles to its legs. So, the voice came from behind her, you're finally awake. Willow said nothing as the owner of the voice came into view. It was a man, maybe a few years older than Sage, with messy brown hair, olive skin, and a malicious grin. You're a very hard person to catch, Willow, he said, crossing his arms. It's almost like you've been avoiding me. I'm hurt, truly. Sorry, do I know you? Willow asked. I mean, you clearly know me. Have we met before? I feel like I've seen you somewhere before. The man stepped closer to her. You have. You were six years old at the time. I'd be surprised if you remember much of it. It's rude of me to presume you'd recognize me. He bowed mockingly. Valkyrie Vesselia, at your service. You're kidding me, Willow snorted. You're the guy who's been hunting me? The guy who burned the village to the ground 11 years ago and has two massive fortresses? Forgive me for not being more afraid, but, well, frankly, you're not very intimidating. Rackery scowled. Rude, but true. You know what? Screw you. I don't care if you're afraid of me or not. Admit it, your ego is wounded. It most certainly is not. Willow snorted again. Yeah, right. You know, for a guy who supposedly wants me dead, you've done a dreadful job of killing me. Well, I can't just kill you, Ragu said, as though this were obvious. There's a ritual. A ritual, she deadpanned. What are you going to do, sacrifice me to the ancient gods? I'm sure that'll go over well. 
Now for your world's eyes. I'm not sacrificing you to the ancient gods, he snapped. Ever heard of blood magic? No, honestly, didn't think so. Blood magic is generally frowned upon due to its tendency to go horribly wrong. So, what, you need my blood for something? Why on earth do you need my blood, or anyone's for that matter? You're more powerful than any other magic user in the entire world. Your blood is the key to exploit that power, Rapper explained. The blood magic ritual, should it be successful, will transfer your power to me. Little girl her eyes. Three things. One, there's no guarantee your stupid ritual thing will actually work. Two, you're an idiot if you think my brothers won't be coming for me. They're a bit overprotective. Finally, you're monologuing. <laughs> I am not. You are. Ugh, you are the singularly most infuriating person I've ever met. And that includes your damn brother. I'll take that as a compliment. Out of curiosity, which brother are you referring to? The tallest one. On second thought, I'm insulted. He is way more infuriating than I am. Throwing his hands into the air helplessly, Bradbury spun on his heels and marched out the door, slamming it behind him. As soon as he was gone, Willow's composure failed and she dissolved into a fit of giggles. This scene was born from both my interactions with people I don't like and my irritation with the villain monologue that somehow finds its way into far too many movies. Of course, it can't all be flustered villains and exasperated siblings. There's also one thing that makes it seem that much more real. Death. Death is one of those things that you have to be really careful with. In every story, there's a Goldilocks number for how many characters you can realistically kill off. I've read enough books to have found a few fantasy stories where there's a big final battle, one where people would have been slaughtered left, right, and center, were it in the real world, and come out on the other side with all of the characters still alive and unrealistically unscathed. But by that same token, you can't just kill everyone off at the end either, because that doesn't happen in the real world any more than no one dying does. I like to think I found the right, realistic number of deaths in my story, that number being five. Obviously, there were a few unnamed background characters who died as well, but five important people. These five people were the three main antagonists, Leaf's dad and Leaf's sister. I knew from the beginning that the three antagonists would die at the end because I couldn't not kill them off. I also decided pretty early on about Leaf's dad, too. He didn't seem all that important to the story, and it felt like the right decision when it came to conflict within the romantic subplot. Leaf's sister, however, was a spur-of-the-moment decision. I was writing out the final battle, and rather abruptly realized I had no idea how to end the story and wrap it all up nicely. Then I thought, what if I killed someone else off? I couldn't kill, <laughs> I couldn't kill Leaf, Willow, or Sage, because I love them too much. I was stumped for a while until I thought of the movie Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. At the end of the movie, Spock dies to save the Enterprise and everyone on it. Spock and Kirk have always had a very brotherly relationship. And with that in mind, the answer came. I wrote the death scene of Leaf's, Leaf's sister and inadvertently sent Jen a bunch of Go Guardian no notifications. <laughs> and then I suddenly knew how to end the story. In fact, the last thousand words or so kind of wrote themselves, which was wonderful. And so, on March 23rd, I typed those two words that I'd been waiting for since October. The end. Thus bringing the story to a bittersweet close, both for the characters and myself. It was finally over. I'd written an almost 33,000 word novella, and I was extremely sleep deprived. At the beginning of this presentation, I said that this project was one of the most grueling things I've ever done. I stand by that sentiment. Yes, it was fun, but it was also tiring, frustrating, and downright ridiculous at times, and I'm pretty sure I lost my mind somewhere back in March. But because of all that craziness, frustration, and the general urges to hurl my Chromebook across the room, finally finishing the first draft of the novella was probably the most satisfying thing I've ever experienced. So yes, it was hell. Yes, I wanted to pull all my hair out and use it as a weapon to utterly destroy every device that could access the working document within a five-foot radius of me. There were a couple of days where my search history would have made it look like I was planning a murder, and therefore I used incognito tabs. So yes, there were times when I thought cho choosing this as my masterworks topic was the worst mistake of my life. And I'd do it again in a heartbeat. <laughs> I'd like to thank my faculty advisor, Andrea Earle, for keeping me on track and reminding me whenever I had a submission due. I'd also like to thank my ex external advisor, Deb Blankhorn, for always having insightful suggestions for improvement and being so supportive even outside our meeting times. 
I'd like to thank Jen Henriksen for being so organized and somehow managing to support all 18 grade nines while also giving us tea. We really needed that tea. <laughs> I'd like to thank Miranda Forster for the amazing cover art she drew and for reading my story multiple times and still somehow being more invested in the plot than I was. I'd like to thank T and Avery for similar reasons, for reading my story multiple times and catching all of the grammar mistakes that I missed, as well as patiently letting me bounce, off, bounce ideas off her and not complaining about it. I'd also like to thank my parents for asking me how my math search was coming a couple of times a month, then nagging me when I continually said almost in regards to how close I was to being finished, and still being so supportive and patient despite the fact that I won't let you read the, fi the finished product. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to thank you all for watching my presentation. Ms. Ross, well done. That was so great. And I know this process has been a long one, and I'm glad you would do it again. <laughs> so we're going to go to questions from your audience now, starting with your faculty advisor. Ms. Ross, congratulations on that wonderful presentation and this gigantic accomplishment. And my question is to relate right to that. Are you planning on seeking a publishing opportunity for your novella, considering the fact that this is quite an accomplishment for someone your age? Um, I am planning to get it published in some form, hopefully over the summer, especially since Jen wants a copy for the school. Um, <laughs> And I have numerous friends and family members who have also asked for a copy. Um, my parents have looked a little bit at publishing websites, and I will join them in that looking once, uh, probably after this, but I haven't been looking at it because I've been worrying about how good my slideshow wasn't. Right, <laughs> right. We discussed this somewhere along in the process of that might be something that we would do during Masterworks. Um, okay, thank you very much. You do realize that we published that book they're going to read it. <laughs> I, I do realize that, yes. <laughs> and to the dad, thanks for a great presentation. I know we all enjoyed it. And uh, as your external advisor, I'd like to ask a kind of external question, which is, what are the works that have most influenced you as a reader and a writer? And what would you recommend to all of us? There is a lot on that list. Um, I somehow managed to read The Lord of the Rings when I was in grade three. It took me all year, um, and I love it more as a movie than as a book because the books are hard to get through, um, which is something that I took when I kept in mind while I was writing my own story. Don't be like Tolkien, don't be pedantic, don't draw everything out. Um, uh, uh, Harry Potter is another big one. Um, I read that when I was younger than I was when I read Lord of the Rings. Uh, it was a lot easier to get through, um, but there were still some things that J.K. Rowling did that I personally didn't enjoy getting through, like the entire beginning of The Order of Phoenix where nothing's really happening and Harry's just being angsty. <laughs> Uh, Percy Jackson is, is a good one that I've read multiple times. It's aimed at um, middle schoolers, so because that's where I am and that's what my intended audience is, I, Rick Riordan is good for taking inspiration from for pacing and writing style, so that's just a fraction. I could go on, but we'd be here all day. <laughs> Any more questions from the advisors? Okay, we'll go to the floor. Questions from the floor. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Ross, hilarious <laughs> and informative. That was the uh, intent. Thanks for making me laugh. Uh, thanks for teaching me about the stories, writing, and taking me through your huge accomplishment of writing something that I don't think I'd ever be able to do. Um, I've studied history, as you might know. Uh, and it came across me a long time ago about the hero. Now the hero always has these things, like all their, pan all their parents die and stuff. And this seems to happen in all our stories. Why is that? Why do heroes leave the parents dead? <laughs> 
my own who doesn't have parents. Uh, mostly because I couldn't figure out how to work them into the story. Um, that could be a reason, actually. The, the writers of the stories didn't know how to fit the parents in, so they just killed them. Um, I don't actually know why every hero doesn't really have parents. I'm assuming it's for plot convenience. Um, like, it gives the character motivation, or it gives them a reason to not stay at home. <laughs> and just let the world end. <laughs> Did you come across these themes, though, and use them in your work? Um, now that I think about it, yes. Although, I didn't notice it at the time. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, Miss Hathaway, you're first. Miss Ross, I have a little bit of a, a weird question. There's been a recent movement, kind of on social media, about people romanticizing their own lives and becoming their own main character of their life. So I'm wondering, what, in your opinion, are some qualifications of a main character and of a protagonist? What, other than not having parents, apparently, <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think is important for a main character in a book? Um. Mostly just, um, it's not just books, it's also movies and stuff, but I find it's more knowing your limits, knowing when you can push those limits and when not to push them, and also knowing that it's okay to back off and not do everything that you said you were gonna do. Like in Moana, uh, they go and they have that fight with Taka and then Maui's hook gets broken and so there's like a huge failure there and she's feeling awful about herself. And so her grandmother's spirit, again with the deceased character speaking to the protagonist in the afterlife, um, her grandmother's spirit shows up and doesn't t give her a pep talk to tell her to keep going, that she can do it. She says, you can go home and that's okay. And I think that's important to remember. I just was wondering if you could put the piece of artwork back up that was made and maybe talk a little tiny bit about that. To flip back to that slide. Dead. 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 Um, yeah, so my friend Miranda has always been very artistically inclined and um, we've known each other for years, and so when in one of our meetings, I think it was Deb who went out possibly getting cover art done, I'm like, ooh, Miranda can do that, and she did not disappoint. <laughs> Yay, Miranda! 